lifts the Bergeron's on. Don't forget the popcorn, Frank. Coming, dear. Hello. Hi, hello. Uh, thank you all for coming um, to the second of the two presentations that we're doing today at Senator Spilker's wonderful event here. Uh, and you, if you talk to her, thank you to Senator Spilker. I think this is just a really important way for a lot of seniors to get a lot of information about a lot of stuff. Uh, what we're going to talk about is a very important topic to a lot of folks. Uh, it's dealing with uh, a loved one, dealing with it yourself, but especially dealing with a loved one who has dementia. Uh, especially, in, and we talked in the first session about early stages of that and recognizing it and what's reversible and what isn't and what you can do. And now we're talking about a more difficult situation. We're talking about my friends Frank and Mary. Whenever I do presentations at Councils on Aging, I'm always talking about Frank and Mary. Um, they have three kids, Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. They, their goal in life is to be buried, to stay in their house until they die and be buried in the backyard. They own a home. They've got some assets. We're going to talk about assets and assets shifting a little bit. Um, and Mary Jr. is the, the designated daughter, right? A lot of people end up with a designated daughter. Very seldom a designated son. So that's the one who's going to kind of take care of things as, as people get older. Uh, and, and their problem right now is that Mary, who has been um, OK living at home, has gotten a lot of support, has gotten home care, has gotten all kinds of things, but has dementia. It's progressed. As we all know, dementia is, goes only in one direction. You're not going to get better from most kinds of dementia. And now she's at the point where something else has to happen, and she needs to be, be, be doing something else. Either there needs to be a tremendous amount of support at home, uh, or she needs to go to a nursing home, or she needs to go to assisted living. So I'm going to start off by talking about the worst one. I started doing this work in 1991 after my mother died in a nursing home. I watched this play out with my dad and her getting worse and hiding basically and nobody coming to the house and my father getting angry and my mother getting apathetic and it was just all, it was the, all the stuff the whole thing and at that time really when all, and Alzheimer's wasn't in the, di in the lexicon kind of at that time right you were just kind of getting old uh, and at that time nursing home was really the only option um, there weren't assisted living facilities there weren't a lot of services available in the home you just kind of you know, you kind of, and no one understood how to deal with the disease. So now there really are three possibilities. You can stay at home, uh, or you can go to a nursing home when things get really serious, or you can go to assisted li living, not in the usual assisted living, but increasingly assisted livings have memory care units in them. And I asked Eric Kessler to, to come today to talk to you about a really wonderful one that's in Marlboro, although there are a number of them in a number of facilities where you've got um, kind of an alternative to nursing homes for folks who, who are really having a hard time and don't have the, the, the family and support to be able to stay at home. So I'm going to talk about all of those. One, so Frank and Mary, uh, they have assets, they have a house that's worth $300,000. They have an IRA, he does, worth $200,000. Uh, they have savings that are about $300,000. Their total assets are $800,000. Uh, Frank has total income of uh, $2,250 and Mary of $750, so they have income of $3,000 a month. Uh, Mary, if Mary needs to go to the nursing home, show of hands, how many people think that they're going to have to spend a lot of this money down before she can qualify for Mass Health and have Mass Health pay for the nursing home care? How many people think she's gonna, they're going to need to spend a lot of money here before they can do it? Um, if you do, you're wrong. And briefly, the reason for that, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to. I'm going to give you a, a, a little brief piece. This is going to come up later on, but I just want you to remember this. The activities of daily living. The activities of daily living are relevant to a lot of programs. Among other things, if someone can't and needs physical assistance with two of these, dressing, eating, toileting, bathing, transferring, that means for mass health purposes, they're eligible for nursing home care, which means if they're in the nursing home, that if they're financially eligible, that MassHealth will pay for the nursing home care above what the income is of the person in the nursing home. So the question then is, if they're in the nursing home, um, can Mary be financially eligible? Well, for her to be financially eligible, she has to have countable assets of less than $2,000. Ooh, that's not very much. They have more than that. But, but Frank can own the home as long as it has an equity of less than $814,000. So in this case, he can own the home. 
He can have cash or cash equivalents, uh, things that can turn into cash, of $117,240. Of course, he has more than that, but that's quite a bit. A lot of people actually have less than that. But most importantly, he can have infinite income, infinite income. So what Frank would do in this case, I'm not sure if I've got a, yes, what Frank can do in this case, it, uh, as long as Mary has given Frank or someone a power of attorney to allow someone to sign her name, Frank can shift all the assets to Frank, take all the assets that are over $117,240 and buy an annuity. What is an annuity? It is a, a contract between an individual and an insurance company. You give them money. In return for that, they give, they give you a promise that they're going to give you back that money plus some interest in monthly payments over a term. As long as the annuity that Frank buys is for a term that is shorter than his actuarial life expectancy, which if he's 80 years old, for example, his life expectancy would be about eight years. Um, the purchase of that annuity is a legitimate conversion from an asset to an income stream. And he can have infinite income, infinite income. So the day after he purchases that annuity and the other assets have been shifted to him, Mary's eligible for mass health, right? So for the, all those people who thought they had to give all their assets away and wait five years, that is incorrect as long as you're married. Right? There are problems if, if your spouse has died. I often have people come in, my husband just died, I want to do some planning regarding you know, saving my assets. Well, that's harder, because then you do have to give things away and wait for five years. But you don't in this case. Now, the only problem in this case, the only problem is, well, what happens if Frank dies? And he's got all these assets. Because remember, their plan, their estate plan is, uh, Frank's giving everything to Mary, Mary's giving everything to Frank, and when they're both dead, they're going to give everything to the kids. Well, that's a problem here, because if Frank dies, now Mary has way more than $2,000, all of which has to be spent down except the house. The house is an accountable asset. But then she'll qualify for Mass Health, and Mass Health will put a lien on the house to recollect after she dies. They can avoid all that. All they have to do is Frank has to change his will. Frank has to change his will so that it says, when I die, I want all my assets to go in trust for the benefit of my wife. I can make Mary the trustee, I can make one of my other kids the trustee. <clears throat> as long as he does that, if he dies, all those assets are immediately safe. They're not countable for mass health purposes. The money can be used by the trustee to supplement Mary's care, take her out to eat, take her on a trip, you know, get her a better wheelchair, all that stuff. But none of it is countable for mass health purposes, and there is no lien against it when, Matt, when Mary dies. So, so if the issue here is nursing home, then they're okay, as long as they do some things. But the point is, they don't want that, right? Clients are constantly coming into me, talking to me about what to do about the one alternative that they hate. So the question is, are there any other alternatives? And the answer is yes, there are two. One of them is a memory care unit and an assisted living facility. In, at this point in Mary's life and in her state of health, she really can't uh, live in a, in, a, in a regular assisted living that doesn't have a memory care component. Why? She's going to wander, right? And, 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 and assisted livings are not locked units, right? She's going to have other issues that in a regular assisted living unit they don't have the staff to deal with. And most importantly, most importantly, she needs to be with people who are trained to understand what dementia is about and how to treat people with dementia. I, 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 back when my mother had it, you know, I, and once again I saw this play out and, and since then I would always, hear, I had always think that there were a, a set of symptoms which are simply symptoms of dementia, right? They are, and you know, you know, this cognitive loss, I can't remember things. There's serious cognitive loss. I can't remember how to brush my teeth, you know. There is fa difficulty following complicated instructions. So there's a whole cluster of things. And then there are these other things. Apathy, <laughs> aggression, depression, anxiety. All the things you associate with people who have Alzheimer's. This, you know, early stages and you see more and more serious in the late stages. More and more I have become persuaded that that cluster of symptoms is not, are not inevitable symptoms of Alzheimer's. They are, the, re, they are the, pe, the individuals reacting to their other symptoms, saying, I'm really depressed. I can't remember anything. I can't remember my wife's name. I can't remember how to brush my teeth. Or their anger, because they're displacing some of that and being angry with their spouse, right? 
or they're, or they're just anxious all the time, right? Or they're just apathetic. Oh my God, my life is over. I might as well just sit here in my chair. So, the, but, but those things can be dealt with by, no, by having a bunch of caregivers who are around the person with Alzheimer's, who understands these things and understands how to deal with them. Really, a lot of what has happened over the last 20 years since, been, since my mother died was that there has evolved this, this really kind of large uh, set of information about dealing with folks with Alzheimer's, what they're going through, and how to deal with them. What, what is unique about memory care units in assisted living facilities is that's what they've focused on in terms of how they've trained their staff to deal with that. Now, um, I've asked Eric Kessler to come to talk about um, the terrific program uh, that is, that it, in, that's in Marlboro, actually, at the, uh, at the New Horizons uh, Assisted Living Facility. Um, it, they have a parallel program in Woburn, in and some in New York. So, to talk about their program. Now, this is not an ad for them, right? But they're really good. But if you've got a person that's in this kind of situation, you ought to look around and figure out whether this is going to work for them, right? Now, these units, I'll tell you ahead of time, are a little expensive, right? But start off by figuring out whether this would work for them, and then figure out whether there are ways that the money can work. And that, once again, I do a whole presentation on how, these, how the finances can work. Among other things, many people in this generation were veterans who served during at least one, one day of war. They didn't even have to be at war. They need to serve during at least one day of war. In that case, that veteran is entitled to as much as $2,000 a month in a benefit if they're in an assisted living facility that is providing these assistances with the activities of daily living and the payment is a bundled payment. In addition to that, payments to, the, to that level of assisted living are tax deductible. So one of the strategies that you can use, and I could go through this in more detail in a longer presentation, one of the strategies that Frank and Mary can use is give away their money to one of their kids, have the kid make the monthly payment to the assisted living facility and now that's tax deductible to the kid. In the example that I give, I've got a son, Peter, who lives in New York City who is a lawyer, making a ton of money. Uh, his tax rate, his income tax rate in New York, counting federal, state, and local, is 40%, which means if he pays his mother's or his parents' assisted living bill of $100,000 in a year, he gets a $40,000 uh, reduction in his taxes as a result, because he's in a 40% bracket. He's paying $40,000 less in taxes. If he's a nice kid, and he doesn't just use that money to go to the Bahamas, but rather throws it back in the pot for the benefit of his parents, he's now extended the value of his parents' savings by 40%. That's a complicated concept. But all I'm saying is, the way you think about assisted livings is first decide whether it would work for the person that you know who has dementia. Go see them. Figure it out. Then talk to some professionals. Don't just talk to your neighbor. Don't just talk to the VA guy downtown. Talk to some professionals and see if there's a way that you can make this thing work. But first, you need to be seeing one of these units. So Eric, can we just talk about those units for a yeah, while? Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. On. Don't forget the popcorn, Frank. Coming, dear. My biggest challenge is, I always say to myself, don't get nervous, and I'm always nervous. And my biggest challenge is going to be, I have to, they told me to So that means you there. can't boo, no matter what he boo, says, you can't. Right. He's like really so depressed. with that. Um, I'd like to ask, if I ask for a show of hands, of how many of you know somebody that's caring with somebody with memory issues, or you, or you yourself is caring for somebody with memory issues, how many people would raise their hand? Okay, all right. Um, what do you notice about what's happening to your friends or yourself that's caring with somebody with, a mem with memory issues, dementias, Alzheimer's? What things do you notice about that person, happening to that person? What things have you noticed? 
who's caring for a loved one. What things do you notice about that person? A lot of stress. A lot of stress. Yeah. So here is our mission. Dr. Zeisel founded Heart Zones, and our approach is I'm still here. And our approach is about hope. Our approach is about, our mission is to create a life worth living every single day as this disease progresses. So research shows that successful treatment uh, for dementia, our symptom, this is a coordinated approach. So what that means is we use both pharmacological and non-pharmacological approaches in combination. We first employ the non-pharmacological approaches to reduce the symptoms. Second, we, are appropriate, uh, we use appropriate uses of medication. An example, Norman was a gentleman who came to us, um, was getting very aggressive at home. Um, Norman was an artist. When he came to us, he was getting very anxious in the afternoon, sundowning. Where's my family? What's going on? What we developed was a visitor's book for Norman. And these are things you can do at home. We had, we've been teaching what we do in the community. We just had a packed, wonderful packed house at the Callahan Senior Center. We're going to be at Sudbury about taking what we do and how you do them at home, how you develop routines, how you do care. So what the family, together, we developed every time somebody would come visit Norman, we would take a picture. We would put it in the book. And then the family would write, Dad, it's me, your son, Peter. I had a wonderful time with you. We talked about ABC. As time went on, Norman went, was able to go out. When he goes out, when they come back, there's a picture with Dad. We went out to the restaurant. We watched the Wimbledon tennis match. I love you and can't wait to see you again. Not a date, but can't wait to see you again. So that's a non-pharmacological approach versus going, we, we try to use we have organizations from around the country, around the world, that come to us to learn what we do. We try to use the least amount of medication possible all the time. Why? Because we want to have, we know the parts of the brain that the dementia doesn't impact, the emotional parts and the procedural learning part, we want to have access to that as much as we can. So Dr. Zeisel talks about um, the four A's of uh, of dementia, of memory issues, of Alzheimer's, apathy, aggression, compatible behaviors, agitation, and anxiety. And what we talk about, if you are focused on meaningful and purposeful things during your day, evening, you're wandering at night in our community, that those symptoms lessen. And this is what we know. The four A's, I should have punched that twice. So our mission, as I said, is to present a hopeful message that we want you and your loved ones to have hope and we want to experience where you can go back to being a wife, where your kids can go back to being sons and daughters, where you can come in and participate and be involved in our programming. As we know, there are 100 billion neurons in the average healthy brain's autopsy of the brain. People with Alzheimer's, that the brain weighs 40 percent. The good news, there are 60 billion neurons left. We focus on the 60 billion neurons left. And I'm going to move through this quickly. Um, and the way we do that, we know how people learn. So if we have, to, we have to create a whole environment based on the parts of the brain that are not impacted. People learn for a ways. Declaratively, I know the name of Boston is the capital of Massachusetts, episodic, you know, what I had last week for, for breakfast, but um, emotional <laughs> memory the birth of a child, your wedding, and procedural memory. The emotional and procedural is still there. That's what we focus on. Um, engagement, engagement, that's the antidote. Engagement, engagement. We invite. Every day I hear, Josephine, would you mind helping me? I'm hearing that all the time from our staff. Um, we have a whole research division, and I'll just give you an example. We create programs. Hearthstone has a whole research division. We have hundreds of different topics from all levels. So you might see ancient mysteries. You notice the font is bigger. And here's the key. And then there's questions. So we want our, your loved ones who are living with us to do anything. We want them to have memorable um, experiences. And we want them, we serve them. So you notice from every stage, We'll have reading groups where there's questions in here. 
The focus is not to finish this, the focus is to generate questions, conversation, emotional engagement. It might be later stage where we're having a category sort. I'm, I might say, Josephine, I'm using you again. I might say, Josephine, I need to pick out a gift for my wife. Would you help me? And I'll have a group of people. And I'll have pictures of gifts. I might have roses. And I might have a, um, an elephant. I might, and would you say with this? And we'll have fun. So that is what we do, that is who we are. We are honored uh, to be able to serve the loved ones that, that we are able to serve, uh, and we appreciate uh, the opportunity to, to uh, speak here. If there's ever any questions, or if you're interested in the, the workshop we're doing at the uh, Sudbury Senior Center, I'm not sure, you have my card, just email me. Thank, Thank you, you Arthur. Uh, Eric asked me if he could go on actually earlier in the presentation than normal because he's, he's, got, he's got to go back to his day job because he's meeting some folks back, at the, uh, um, back in Marlboro. Am I right? Yeah. Um, but this is really an amazing, theirs is an amazing program. Um, and, they've, and, and one of the reasons is that it's really research based, but it's all based on this notion, once again, common among memory care units, right? That folks, can some, that folks can still learn, that there are some activities that you don't forget, right? And that the key is to be having folks that are around you that are accenting that, not accenting the cognitive losses. For instance, I had this wonderful woman who talked to me the other day, and I was doing, we're doing, I'm doing some work with her, uh, and she said, I just get so frustrated. She says, I went to the nursing home the other day, because her husband's in the nursing home now, and he, and he said, and he said Oh, meet Sarah. She's my nurse. She, I, she, no, she, meet Sarah. She's my wife. She helps me every day, right? And the woman was like, I was so depressed. But once again, from kind of learning from people like Eric, I said, that's not what your husband's saying. What your husband is saying is, my wife is wonderful. She took care of me every day. That's what this woman is doing. She's like my wife, you know? Well, you know, that's the kind of thing that you need to learn. If you're, if you're in an assisted living in a memory care unit, the, all of the people who are dealing with your loved ones are people who have learned that and are trying to understand it better and better. If you want to stay at home instead, and I'm going to run through those few, and, 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 but if you want to stay at home, then you need to be trying to do something very similar. You need to be trying to learn and have your family members and others who are dealing with your loved one regularly learn many of these same things. Now one place that you can go to to find a lot of that, whoops, I'm, I'm just going to run through those. Those, those are all, we talked earlier about the, is the Alzheimer's Association. The Alzheimer's Association can help train folks that are around you and you yourself to help you deal with the person that you have who has dementia. Then you can find programs to help you support that by working with BayPath. How many, raise your hand, how many people know what BayPath Elder Services is? Raise your hand. Oh, only a few. BayPath Elder Services, the state is divided into uh, regions. And in those regions, all the federal and state money that comes into, these, into Massachusetts is funneled through these regions to folks, to elders. Uh, and BayPath Elder Services in this region is the, the, the spigot. They're the ones who decide who gets what. Among other things, they're the ones that decide um, whether you are eligible for mass health, whether, you, whether your loved one is eligible to go to a nursing home, and also whether with, with home care, he could stay at home or she could stay at home. In this case, whether Mary could stay at home with enough home care. And if, there, and if she can, then BayPath is going to be willing to pay for that home care. As much of the home care, um, really, as BayPath says that you need in order to stay at home. Now, uh, and that's, the program, that's a program called the Frail Elder Waiver Program. There's a second program parallel to that, which is called the Personal Care Attendant Program. I'm not going to go into detail into those. These are all kind of presentations in themselves. But I want to, but, but, and, and BayPath provides a variety of other support services at home. But I want to talk about briefly, as this relates to Frank and Mary as this relates to Frank and Mary. So if Mary is at the level where she would otherwise be eligible for a nursing home because she needs assistance with at least two of the activities of daily living, remember we went through those, right? She cannot, and, and if Baypath says that, and Baypath says that she needs 
30 hours of home care a week, right, in order to stay at home, um, then MassHealth will pay for those 30 hours a week as long as Mary is financially eligible. To be financially eligible, Mary can only have $2,000 in countable assets, just like the other program, the nursing home program. But in this program, Frank can have unlimited assets. So all Mary has to do to qualify for this program is shift all of her assets to Frank and the next day she qualifies. There is an income, there is an income limit above which she has to pay a copay, but that income limit is $2,164 a month. Don't ask me where these numbers come from. They come from the sky, but that's the number, $2,164 a month. But only her income is counted, and she only makes $750 a month. By the way, if Frank needed the program, he'd be over that income number, which means he'd have to pay a copay. But except for that copay, MassHealth will pay for a lot of the remaining services, right? So my, my bottom line is if you want to stay at home, and if the home is still otherwise safe enough for you to stay at home, you can stay at home, right? Now also, Frank and Mary have other assets. And remember Frank and Mary's goal? They want to die and be buried in the backyard. They're willing to spend their assets to die and be buried in the backyard, which means they've got an additional $500,000. That's not nothing, right? If they needed it to pay for nursing home care, it would be nothing, because that's $150,000 a year. But to stay home or to supplement the care that MassHealth would pay, they've got a lot of money. In addition, they own a house. Now I never tell clients, never tell clients to think about reverse mortgages for their house. Except here. Except here. If Frank and Mary are 80 years old and their goal is to die and be buried in the backyard, they've got enough assets when combined with the, the mass health programs to do that. To, to, to supplement, because they've got $30,000 a year worth of income, Right? They can get a lot of home care paid for by MassHealth, and they've got $800,000 to supplement all of that. Well, not all $800,000. At their age, if they applied for a reverse mortgage, they would get about, about $150,000 in value out of their house for the reverse mortgage. But that's a lot of money. So they can stay home. So the question then is, what about, and, and so that's what you'd have to do. They'd shift their assets to Frank. Once again, Frank would want to then change his will to say, if I die, I want everything in trust for the benefit of my wife, Mary, so that if he dies, and if it's possible, because the Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. are helping take care of my, et cetera, Ma can stay at home. Um, but the question then is, so what do you think about home care? Oh, all these strangers coming into my house, right? Mary's not gonna like that. I'm not gonna like that. How does all of that work? So, like with memory care units, there are a lot of home care agencies, but I wanted you to hear from one of the best ones, right? I shouldn't, that's not an ad. I wanted you to hear from a home care agency that we worked with a lot and we think they're good, so that they, she can talk to you, Melissa Plood, just to talk to you a little bit about how theirs works, the kinds of services that you could get, right? And how you should shop around if you're looking for a home care agency. Melissa. Thanks so much, Art. Thanks everybody for coming today, I appreciate it. Let me just grab it from you. Um, so, with Frank and Mary, with Frank and Mary. Frank, Frank, hurry, Mr. Bergeron's on. Don't forget the popcorn, Frank. Coming, dear. I'm the manager at Healthcare Staffing, which is the private pay arm of Care Solutions. And the reason I'm just mentioning that is because our company, not all companies do, but our company has what we call a skilled side, which is when you come out of the hospital and you need a VNA, called Home Care Solutions, and a private pay side, which is called Healthcare Staffing. And the reason I mention that is because when you have a company that does both, they can really work together because I encourage people to get as much insurance covered services first before they go to private pay options. Unfortunately, Medicare will not pay for somebody to stay home and have 24 hour care. They're not going to pay for that. In fact, all that Medicare will pay for through a VNA is one or two hours a week of assistance with a shower. So that's when we step in to cover those different times. So maybe Bay Path is covering these many hours and the um, Medicare is covering these many hours, but 
you still have to go to work. You still have children to take care of. You have other things too. So it's nice to have a trusted agency. And what does that mean to have a trusted agency? Um, I know we get to it a little bit further, but I, I'm a licensed social worker. And for me, I'm extremely passionate about teaching my aides to provide proper care for somebody who has dementia. And there's a lot of tools that you can learn to be a better caregiver. You can learn how to not have that resistance and the argumentative and things like that. What I teach my aides is you go to where your wife is. You don't bring your wife into your reality. You need to step into their reality. And we talk about tips and techniques and ways to reapproach and redirect and step away and come back. And there's so many different things that you can learn about that. And actually, I will just mention one quick thing. I am teaching a class, a free class to family caregivers that are caring for someone with Alzheimer's. If you want to talk to me after the class, we go more in depth about that. So the things that I'm teaching my aides can also be taught to family caregivers who are caring for their loved ones at home. And by the way, the basis of that program was actually designed by the Alzheimer's Association. It's a great program mm -hmm. if you have time to do it. Yep. Um, and it's called the habilitation therapy because we always hear the word rehabilitation. When you're working with somebody with dementia, they're not going to relearn things that they've lost. That's what rehab means. So it's called the habilitation therapy, meaning let's work on the skills that we still have. Let's focus on what we can do, not trying to reteach the things that we've lost, because that will just be frustrating. It will be very, very hard for you. And I see a lot of frustration with the daughters, with the spouses, and you know, I see a lot of, um, you know, what do you mean you don't know who I am? And I was here yesterday. Why are you telling the staff that you haven't seen me in 10 years? And you know, all these things, it's very frustrating and you personalize it. So it's really to help you not personalize it. It's the disease process that we need to understand. So what's very important about helping somebody at home is really personalizing their care plan to suit them as an individual. And I was talking to Brenda, I think she, um, before I came in here, Brenda works for art here, um, about, and Eric touched on it, it's called purposeful engagement. So, you know, oftentimes you walk into a unit that isn't, you know, maybe they're not trained very well in the curriculum, and you see a whole group of people all doing the same task. That's not always effective. So like at Tammy's program, the Pleasantries Day Health, you have a couple people over here doing this activity, a couple people over here doing that activity, and what that's called is purposeful engagement. So if you have a gentleman who is a, a military man, you know, are you going to have him like, you know, shifting through a laundry basket with clothes and things like that, or might something else be more engaging to him? Or if I have a mechanical engineer or, you know, somebody like that, that we, we would take apart a radio and they tinker with it and things like that. That gives him purpose. Maybe someone else worked as a secretary. I've seen this in dementia units where we would have, you know, Mary behind the counter just shifting through papers like she was at work, you know, and she loves it. It gives her, it gives her a feeling of purpose. And that's why they call the purposeful engagement. So what I do when I meet with families, I ask them, and this just actually, let's say two weeks ago, I was with a family, and I said, I want to know what we can do to enhance your father's quality of life when my aide is with him. So tell me about his hobbies. Tell me about his history. Tell me about his life. And the son's like, you know, he really doesn't have any hobbies. Because I'm you know, trying to engage him, like, you know, does he like to do puzzles? Does he like to do games? Does he like to watch certain shows on TV? Does he have a favorite you know, uh, musician he likes to listen to? All these kind of questions to get people. And he's like, you know what? I don't know what to tell you. And I said, well, tell me a little bit about your dad's life. And he said, oh, well, he was really big in the Shriners. And charitable and philanthropy is so important to him. And he loves his grandchildren so much. And he always had a, like, so I really, when you ask them to open up about that, they really get going. And like, they remember all the things that dad loved when he was active in the community. And I said, so for him, his purposeful engagement is for my aide to say, Tell me about your grandchildren. Oh, I see the pictures over here. Tell me about them. I heard that you do a lot of charity work. Can you tell me what the Shriners are about? And you see them light up. 
It's beautiful. But you know, if you didn't get that history from them and you just walked in and said, you know, so what did you do for work? You know, who know, you know, maybe he doesn't even remember what he did for work. But when you bring things up to them, it's it's a really it's really beautiful. And so to customize a care plan based on the client's needs, you can't do that until you know that history, until you know about that person. Um, so for home care, with insurance covered home care, you don't get to really pick the days and times. You'll have someone call you that morning and say the aide will be there at three to help mom with the shower. And that's what happens. <laughs> with private home care, you might need, maybe you have your um, dad living at home with you and you want, you still have to work or maybe you take care of them during the day, but they're up a lot at night and they're agitated. So maybe I just want somebody to come in from like 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. so I can sleep. The hardest thing about being a caregiver is that burnout where you're not sleeping, you're not eating, you're not engaging in your own personal needs because it's always about them, like Eric said. So, you know, maybe you're a better caregiver if you actually sleep at night. So that's a good, you know, option for some people. Other people is, you know what, dad goes to a day program, I need someone come to the house from 7 to 9 in the morning to help him get up, dressed, ready, and put on the bus. And that's a way, and then I work, or maybe I just need someone four to six. Whatever you personally choose when you're paying private care, you know, our wish is your command. Whatever you want is what we do. And that's a nice benefit, too, of having the private care. But we're available 24 hours a day, seven days a week, at all times, you know. And a lot of times I have somebody say, oh my God, the, the hospital just told me mom is coming home tonight. What do I do? You know, and a lot of times we do get those kind of crisis calls. And our goal is to put the person at ease, reduce their stress, and say, no problem. We'll have someone there at six. And I'll go to the hospital, I'll meet with them, I'll get everything set up so they feel at ease. And it's nice to have, I go to 99% of what I call my starts of care. So every time a client calls or a new person looking for business, if they, like I need some help, whatever, I'm there. I'm at the hospital, I'm at the facility, I'm wherever they are, I meet them, I meet the family, I put together. Then the day we start, I go back and introduce the aid to them. Are you comfortable, you know, you, and I call it SeniorMatch.com because I do a really good job at matching the right aid with the right client. And that chemistry is very important to create success. Once in a, a thousand times, we might have someone that just, you know, it's kind of like we don't click. So we make a change. It's, you know, it's not that hard. We, we are very fluid. Um, so again, and I talked about that respite, you know, if you're a caregiver and you just need a break. I have a lady right now, she goes, I just want to go to the hairdresser on Fridays. So we have someone that comes from 12 to 3 on Fridays. And that's, that's her like little spa day for herself. So paying for private home care, I already talked about Bay Path Mass Home Care Program. Long-term care insurance, I'll just one quick thing. If you have long-term care insurance, the typical policy, everyone's policy is like a gazillion different policies. But let's, for example, say that your policy will pay for $150 a day of at least two or three ADLs, which Art had mentioned, the bathing, dressing, grooming, activities of daily living. Um, so what we do is we have a flow sheet that our aides check off. On this day, I helped, you know, Mr. Smith with a shower, with toileting, with dressing, with companionship. I did his laundry and blah, 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 the whole thing. And then the family submits that to the long-term care insurance and then they get reimbursed. So that's a really nice um, option for a lot of people. But not everybody really jumped on the long-term care insurance wagon. I'm getting, the more years that I do this, I'm starting to get more and more that have it now because it really was only, I would say, popularized about like five to 10 years, in the last five to 10 years. So more people, huh? Oh, I have 30 seconds. OK, real quick. So the question is that. Agency versus private home care. I'm on the board of directors for the Home Care Aid Council of Massachusetts. And one of the things that we talk about is if you're hiring somebody out of Craigslist, just be careful, be alert, be aware. Questions you want to ask, you know, when you hire a bona fide agency, they're going to pay your payroll taxes, their social security taxes, their license, they're bonded, insured. If that aid hurts your loved one and you just pluck them out of Craigslist, who's going to pay for that? If they steal something, what's your repercussions? What, what can you do about that? If they hurt themselves on your property, what's going to happen then? So these are things to think about. The Home Care Aid Council of Massachusetts has a wonderful brochure that talks about when you're hiring on your own versus hiring from a bona fide agency. 
Massachusetts does not regulate private home care companies. This is key. So you want to find a company whose standards of care are up here because they're doing the right thing. Not because someone's telling them that they have to, but we are a Medicare certified company, so we have higher standards anyway. But those are the things that you definitely want to ask. Are they licensed, insured, accredited? Do, what's the employment process? Do they do background checks? You as an individual don't have the opportunity to do criminal background checks and driving record checks. And um, anyone can go on to the office of the Inspector General and see if there's ever been any fraud against that license. I do that every month on every one of my aides. And um, it's labor intensive for sure, but you know what? I want to make sure the aids I'm putting in your home, you know, aren't fraudulent or things like that. Um, now, we Melissa, do. I want to be able to close with one example, so okay. you have to stop. Okay. Okay. You have to stop. So I'm done. <laughs> if she you stopped. have any questions, let me know. So now, isn't she great? And, and she's gonna and she's gonna take um, she's gonna take questions afterwards because there's gonna there's, there's the break. But I just wanted to give you one example. So I've got a wonderful woman. She's 86 years old. She lives in Marlboro. She was unaware of any of these programs. She's, she had spent down literally all of her money. She had her house left that's worth about $200,000, $250,000. Her only alternative was nursing home. She's still mentally fine. She's physically disabled. She's got some serious problems, right? We have now, we got her a reverse mortgage so that she's got now a reserve of about $120,000. We qualified her for uh, um, the frail elder waiver, so she's getting 35 hours a week paid for by Mass Health. She now has enough extra cash, because her income is about $2,500 a month, to pay for the extra home care that she needs, the extra home care that Mass Health isn't going to be able to manage to pay for. She's going to be able to die and be buried in the backyard. She's gonna, she has enough resources now to stay in that house for another 10 years. She thought she had about four months left. The point is, you can figure this out. If you want to stay home, you can figure it out. And if that's where you want to be, that's where you should be. Thank you very, very much. I'm sorry I ran a few minutes over. Now, okay, that's a good attorney to go yep. through that process. Yeah, that so, too. That's important. Thank you all. I'm sorry that I ran over on you. Those are all right. All right.